Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to get started in just a second. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I am your host, Taryn Picard. I am the Senior Sales Manager for our U.S. Direct team here at Onset. I've been with Onset for just over eight years, and I absolutely love data loggers. So I'm excited to have you joining us today so we can talk about our HOBA loggers. Webinar details. So just so you are aware, this webinar is set to run for approximately 30 minutes. We're going to do our best to save five minutes at the very end for question and answers. But if we can't get to your question, please don't feel please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to help you. And if you have questions during the broadcast, you can type them into the questions section of the control panel. This webinar is being recorded, and afterwards we will send out an email with a link to it. So if you miss anything or want to go back and view it again live, you certainly can. So who we are and what we do, we are Onset Computer, home of the Hobo Data Loggers. We have been in business for over 40 years, and we practice lean manufacturing operations. And we are an ISO 9000-2015 certified company. So not only are we making the best data loggers in the world, but we are doing our best to make them the most efficiently efficient way we can. Today's presenter is Sean Kelly. He is a account development manager here at Onset. He has over 10 years of experience assisting customers in our indoor environmental monitoring market. And previously, before he moved into his role as an account development manager, he was with our technical support team. So he is definitely an expert in data logging. And I'm super excited to let you guys all know that joining us today is a licensed professional consulting engineer, Steve DiGiacomo, who is the founder of Energy Management Associates. For the past 35 years, Steve has been an energy auditor and HVAC controls troubleshooter. He has taken hobo data loggers all over the US and Europe. Due to the pandemic, Steve has been providing UVC germicidal dosage engineering services. He is an advocate for increasing K through 12 air changes via a combination of ventilation air and air filters. Just last month, Steve's Franklin High School design was featured on CBS Boston Evening News. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. Our agenda today will be to talk about why we should be monitoring CO2, what are considered acceptable levels of CO2 in buildings, factors that affect CO2 indoors. We'll turn it over to Steve, our guest speaker, and again, we'll try to leave some Q&A time at the very end. With that, I will turn it over to Sean. Thanks, Taryn. Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming today from wherever you may be. Um, as Taryn mentioned, uh, my name is Sean Kelly. I am an account development manager in our applications group, specialized with, in our indoor um, data loggers. So one of the things uh, over the past, I would say nine to 12 months, what I've been hearing from customers is, how can I monitor or what can I do to show people that I'm doing everything I can because of COVID? And how can I show them that it's safe to come into my building or my yoga studio or whatever it may be? And CO2 monitoring wouldn't necessarily make it safe. It just gives you a good idea of what's going on in the room, what those air change rates are. So why monitor CO2? Because in those spaces, when you breathe, you're, well, most people know this, but you're predominantly exhaling CO2. So when you do that, you're also exhaling bacteria, which can lead to the risk of an airborne transmission of viruses. So now, if you have higher CO2 levels, that indicates that there's less ventilation, so there's less air changes. So it's not bringing in that fresh air and taking out the stale air. The more air exchange rates you have in an hour, then the, the better your, your ventilation really is. Now with CO2 levels, um, ASHRAE standard 55, optimal levels uh, in, in a building or in a space, you're looking to 
have your temperature range be in the 68 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit, your relative humidity 40 to 60 percent, and then your CO2 levels 800 to 1,000. Now, that's up for debate there because really what you're looking to do is gauge the differential of that CO2 um, concentration. So you have your outdoor CO2 levels, your indoor CO2 levels at, at their max, and you really don't want to go much more, I believe, uh, I believe it's around 700 ppm, that differential. Luckily, we have Steve here today, the expert, that's going to be able to, to get into that a little bit more. Tell us about those CO2 um, differential readings and, and what you can do or what those mean when we get into those air change rates. Some of the key factors that affect CO2 level, the number of people in a room and what they're doing. So you could have a, um, say a call center that's full of people speaking the entire day and slowly the the CO2 or actually or rapidly those CO2 rates um, increase. So it, it matters what they're doing because it could also be say a weight room in a in a high school where maybe there's more people than really should be but they're also you know expelling more CO2 based on what they're doing you know in a in a smaller space, so that concentration rises. Uh, also, combustion. So if it's uh, the science uh, lab that's, that's using Bunsen burners, that can affect the CO2 rate. We already touched on the ventilation rate, so that's those air changes throughout the day or throughout the hour, and then also that differential with that outdoor CO2 concentration. Now, I would be remiss I go through this webinar without a sales pitch. So this is my my quick couple minutes on this particular logger, which is probably our most popular logger over the last nine to 12 months. And this is our MX1102A Bluetooth, actually, and USB uh, data logger. It's going to measure CO2 from zero to 5,000 ppm. Uh, it does, as I touched on, temperature and relative humidity. The cool, or what I think the coolest thing about this logger is it has a six month battery life, which is rare. It's, it's tough to find when you're talking CO2 sensors, not to mention data loggers as well. You have the ability to move this logger from room to room if you wanted to. And that's actually something that we're seeing with school districts um, over the past few months is that they'll take a handful of these loggers and some will put them in a classroom for two weeks and then move them to the next one. And they can place it where they want. And where, so they're not slave to where that outlet is to, to be able to plug it in. So, and then we have others that will leave them in every, a school district that'll do one of these in every classroom and leave them permanently. And that's more that they're able to provide data when needed and they're able to troubleshoot the HVAC system based on the levels that they're they're coming back with. Now, one of the things that we have noticed is that some of our customers don't want that LCD display. So you do have the ability to turn that off. And if you wanted to go a step further, if it was something where you wanted to protect it, we do have lockable vented cases as well. So you, you'd be able to lock it up. You could turn off the LCD. No one's going to be able to touch it. No one's going to be able to see what's going on. Now, it does have a self-calibrating sensor. So initially, we recommend doing a manual calibration. So what you'll do is you'll configure it. You'll place it outside. Let it acclimate five to 10 minutes. You hit the calibrate button. Goes through a five-minute calibration um, initiation then you can put it in place. You know that it's been, what it's doing is it's taking the outside air uh, and it's calibrating that to 400 ppm. So it's seeing, saying what I see outside is equal to 400 ppm. Now I can take it inside, put it wherever I want. If it's an unoccupied space that you're placing it in, like a classroom, like an office space, then what you'd also want to do is use that auto calibration feature. And what that'll do is every eight days, it will take 
the three lowest consecutive readings over that eight day period, then adjust to 400 PPM. So that way you're uh, lessening any issue or any potential issue with drift over time. If it's in a space that's occupied uh, throughout the day, 24 hours, then you would want to um, just do the manual calibration and then do a manual calibration every uh, 8 to 12, 14 days. And then that way, again, you're, you're lessening the, the potential for drift. This is compatible with our MX gateway. So if you wanted that more hands-off approach where you want to log, have that data go up to a cloud, and you could, you'd could you be able to see the data on hobolink.com, which is our cloud. You'd be able to set up custom data exports, alarm notifications to email or text. You could set up data delivery to uh, an FTP site or email, and you could set up a custom data dashboard. So you could, I, the way I explain it is it's a clean slate. You, you go in, you can go up to 20 widgets on this dashboard. It could be a thermometer icon. It can be a line chart where you can overlay values. So you could overlay temperatures from multiple loggers if you wanted to. You can make that public. So you'd be able to get a URL or a web address that you'd be able to provide to whomever you'd like. They can go in. It's like a read only. So they're only seeing what's there, the data as it's coming in. And then they don't have access to any administrative privileges of your account. They can't go into your account. It's a, just a quick snapshot for you. So, uh, and finally, this meets the ASHRAE guidelines. And, and when I say that, it's for reopening, it's the, that um, ASHRAE recommendations for reopening of schools and universities that came out in May of 2020. So with that, that's my pitch. So if you have any questions, let me know. But what I'll do now is I'll turn it over to Steve, whom over the last year I have learned so much, and I'm so thankful to have him here with us today and also the, uh, the information that he's provided me over the last year. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Sean. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to attend this webinar. I'm delighted to be here to share three slides on the subject of reducing airborne transmission of infectious diseases using ventilation, uh, where we employ the axiom of uh, solution to pollution is dilution, and filtration, where we obviously arrest submicron particles. I plan to move quickly uh, through all three slides uh, and basically allowing more time for questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to spend a fair amount of time with slide one and then not so much time with slide two and the remainder of our time with slide three. So we're looking at slide one. Um, this chart um, represents uh, typical data I collect schools and offices, bringing together uh, data from uh, six standard sensors. On the upper right corner, we have a legend. It's color coded. It describes what you're looking at. Um, some a priori knowledge of the HVAC system that you're monitoring is always helpful in making final determinations. Uh, this data was collected in April of 2019. It was pre-pandemic data, obviously. Uh, the view we're looking at is what I call week at a glance. It's essentially noontime Friday to the following noon on Friday. Uh, the raw data is pulled together by the Hobo software from three different Hobo devices as simply as copying and pasting it in. Um, we can always zoom in and get higher resolution. We can look at one day, or we can look at all seven as we're doing, or we can really get into hourly data, 10-minute data, as high a resolution as desired. Um, the, what we're looking at here is indoor temperature, indoor relative humidity, indoor light intensity, indoor CO2, outdoor temperature. Uh, I didn't bother to import the outdoor relative humidity, but I could have. And the, finally, the supply fan motor status. Um, I used only hobo defaults. In other words, I didn't do anything. Um, and I was very pleased with the, the, the week at a glance. Um, the software, in other words, selected the line thickness, the line colors. It added all the necessary uh, y-axes, the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. It selected appropriate scaling so all the data is viewable. Uh, I just couldn't be more pleased with uh, this this hobo data. 
So once you begin looking at the data and, and, and you read it from left to right, the raw data becomes information and it begins to tell a story. For example, the brown or crimson line is our CO2, as the legend indicates. Uh, yeah, thank you. As we read the chart from left to right, um, we beginning on Friday, the 26th, uh, we have a first hump and then it drops down the CO2 Saturday, Sunday, nobody in the office, or this could be a classroom, but in this case, it's an office. So it flattens out and we're looking at about 470 parts per million of um, baseline. And then our first hump on Monday morning as people show up in the office, uh, we see our second hump, that's Tuesday. We can just count them right off. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday afternoon around noontime, I came in and, and picked up the, the loggers. Uh, the maximum CO2 is only about 650 parts per million. Uh, the differential CO2 is roughly 180 parts per million, which equates to 60 CFM per person of ventilation air, or sometimes ventilation air is referred to as outdoor air interchangeably. Uh, this 60 CFM per person is about triple or three times the code required amount of ventilation air. Pre pandemic, this is considered significantly uh, overventilating um, and costing energy. In post pandemic world, uh, we're still significantly overventilating, but that can uh, lead to a healthier building, as we'll get into the, further in the final slide. In the final slide, you'll all be experts at measuring differential CO2 and determining CFM of OA per person. Other things we quickly can see from this particular slide is the, uh, the green line is the lights. We notice that the light intensity uh, is appropriate. They, they come on and off. They kind of rise and fall along with the CO2. So as people enter the space, the CO2 rises and the lights are on. Um, the, the, um, one of the takeaways here is the horizontal black line. That shows us the supply fan motor never turned off the entire week. That is very wasteful, whether you're living in a pre-pandemic or a post-pandemic world. So Sean, if we could advance to the next slide, we're just gonna spend about one minute on this slide. The takeaway here is the log data, once interpreted, can become important data input for fan and pump motor calculations ventilation temperature bin calculations, air change calculations, we'll be, which we'll be discussing further in the last slide. Um, calculation methods typically use, you know, we're still using, not too many people are using slide rules or Abacus anymore, but some people are using calculators and certainly spreadsheets and 3D energy models. Uh, you know, we can generate uh, a lot of different reports from these type of uh, modalities. So, Sean, if you would be so nice to thank you. So, this is our third and final slide. Equation one can be found in ASHRAE 62.1, which is an ANSI standard. It's entitled Ventilation for Acceptable Indoor Air Quality. If you, know, if you wish to know more about this equation, including its derivation, you can download an article from my website entitled CO2 Demand Control Ventilation, History, Theory, and Myths. It was published uh, by Engineer Systems Magazine. Um, this equation one will tell us the steady state CFM of OA or ventilation air per person based on differential CO2 concentration and the activity level in the space. Typically an office or a classroom, a human, a normal sized human will generate about a hundredth of a CFM of CO2 per minute. Um, and this leads to a, a steady state equation that basically will provide CFM per person uh, if we know this differential CO2. So the numerator is essentially a constant and the denominator is very, essentially a variable. Uh, this equation can cascade nicely into the next equation. Uh, remember from our very, very first slide, we mentioned uh, 180 parts per million differential, and that leads to 60 CFM of OA per person. So basically the 0.0106 times a million, that's 10,600. 
So 10,600 divided by 180 is essentially 60. So there's your 60 CFM per person. Now, if we take that 60 CFM per person and we multiply by the number of students in the classroom, for example, which is, we, which is something we've been doing uh, during the pandemic, um, that'll get us to a number that's 600 CFM of airflow for the classroom. So that's a very straightforward equation two. Now equation three, we will basically cascade right into that equation, um, taking this 600 CFM of OA, which would represent the numerator of the equation, dividing by the room volume in cubic feet, which is the length of the room, the width of the room, and the ceiling height, uh, converting from minutes to hours, we can determine air changes per hour, so the ventilation air changes per hour, which began with differential CO2 readings, and we added the number of people, mathematically works out in this example to 4.4 air changes per hour. Now this is where things get very interesting. The Harvard School of Public Health, uh, the T.H. Chan School of Public Health, has published a guide called Healthy Buildings. And uh, I quote, to maintain good indoor air quality, providing five air changes per hour minimum is recommended. And this may be achieved by a combination of both outdoor air ventilation and supplementary air cleaning by PACs or portable air cleaning devices, typically HEPA filters. You can literally roll them in on, a, on casters. So if we basically want to determine the air changes contributed through the filtration, it's the same equation three, but instead of CFM of OA, we're using the CFM being drawn through the HEPAs. In this case, uh, we have 500 CFM of HEPA air, uh, and we have the same room, 8,100 cubic feet, and we convert from minutes to hours using 60, and we're at 3.7 effective air changes contributed by the HEPA. And according to Harvard, we can essentially add the two numbers together and we arrive at about 8.1. So we're north of the recommended minimum of five for this particular uh, example classroom. Um, and I encourage everyone to always aim high um, because there are things we need to account for engineering wise, such as short cycling of the HEPAs. So if you have one large HEPA in one big classroom, there's gonna be maybe 20, 30% of short cycling. You need to account for that. Um, we can also talk a little bit about a ventilation effect of this. You need to account for that. Um, and I'm gonna end with an answer to a question I typically get, which is if a HEPA is rated at 99.97% capture at 0.3 micron, how is it it's able to capture SARS, which is only 0.1 micron? And the answer is the capture rate actually goes up as the particle sizes drop below 0.2 microns because it has been shown by NASA and all the MERV manufacturers published data that at 0.2 microns, we have an inflection point where particles behave less like a particle and more like a gas. So they're subjected to Brownian motion. So they move forward towards the HEPA. Not only are they moving forward, they're also moving up and down and side to side. So the capture rate actually increases for particle sizes below 0.2 microns, such as SARS, from 99.97% to 99.99998%. So at that point, I'm done with the slides and we can open it up to questions. Perfect, thank you so much. That was great. Um, actually, I had a question. So you had mentioned, Steve, that the Harvard School of Public Health would recommends five air changes per hour. How did they come up with that? Do you know offhand or? Um, that is, they, the short answer is, it's a consensus-based number based on discussions with CDC and other entities. Um, that's the short answer. There's so much we don't know about viral loads. 
especially this particular virus. I think ASHRAE, and if you visit their website, uh, has listed a whole bunch of uh, research areas for future research so that we can get a better handle on that number. Okay. Um, okay, here's a question that came in. Um, we talked a lot about, this is me here, um, we talked a lot about differential uh, CO2. And th this question is, is it best to use two sensors to take differential CO2, so one outdoor and one indoor, or one sensor or logger? Okay, so for, for classrooms and offices that are um, external, they're not, interior, not in the interior of a building, and you're, especially if they're only five days a week, if you use a single sensor, um, I would say around three in the morning, so you're basically running the entire week, and come three in the morning on a Monday morning, your CO2 level is going to be about as low as it's going to be that would probably very closely mimic the outdoor air CO2 level. So you really don't have to worry about sensor calibration. If you use a single sensor and use the min provided at four in the morning on a Monday after a weekend of being off, the building's gonna be very flush, as flush as it's going to be. And this way you cancel out any um, calibration issues. Okay. Perfect. If you're dealing with two sensors, you have to deal with the calibration of both sensors and the error with both sensors. Right. So you're, you're assuming they're both the same. Okay. So, um, all right, let's see if I can get this one. Uh, if UVC germicidal lamps are installed in the return air duct uh, or at the air handling unit, does this change the ventilation air changes per hour calculation using the CO2 differential? Yes. Yes, you would no longer use the differential CO2 technique to determine um, CFM per person of fresh air. You instead would use the uh, total airflow of the air handling system multiplied by the, uh, the kill rate on the UV system that was installed. If it was a two log or a two cycle kill rate, 99%, you would multiply the CFM by 0.99. And if it was a three log kill, you'd multiply by 0.999. Okay. Um, and, and then you would do your calculation that way. All right, perfect. All right. I think that's pretty much our time. Now, I know that we have other questions out there. Um, if we hadn't gotten to your question, we will follow up with you absolutely uh, and get you that information. But what I wanted to do was thanks Steve first of all and if you have any questions for Steve if you want to reach out and, and hear more about what Steve does and possibly um, ways that he could help you by all means it's Steve DiGiacomo um, at EMA Boston and that's Steve at EMA-Boston.com or his email uh, sorry his website EMA-Boston.com and he'll be happy to help if you have questions about loggers want to talk um, I'm around 508-743-3155 or email me at sean underscore kelly at onsetcomp.com. Uh, also want to remind everybody that, that we have technical support available from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. That's Monday through Friday. And that's at no additional cost. So once you purchase loggers from us, then that tech support comes along with it. And then uh, our general sales uh, folks are always available as well. Uh, sales at onsetcomp.com. And with that, I thank you very much. I hope everyone stays safe and everyone gets vaccinated and, and we're all back out there soon. Thank you.